All right. Welcome, everybody. It's uh, 12 o'clock Pacific time, so I'd like to go ahead and get started. Um, as I do this intro, we'll probably have some more people joining us. Uh, for those of you that, that got in early and are here, uh, welcome. Uh, this is a very exciting topic, uh, probably one of my more favorite topics to talk about because um, it is, you know, emerging technology. Um, it's about solving problems. It's about the future of head health safety. Um, and, you know, this is also an interesting topic that not too many people know about. So I'm really excited to go into detail about what head impact monitoring is and why it's important. I'm guessing um, we're all here because we care about head safety and have realized that the current protocols and procedures that are in place aren't solving problems. Uh, we're still seeing a rise in head injuries, a rise in concussions. Um, so there's a lot more that can hopefully be done to help drive these numbers down. Um, and I think this topic will help provide a lot of insights around that and, and, and really how we can combat um, head injuries. The Q&A box and chat should be up. Um, I, I don't anticipate this presentation going the entire hour, so uh, I will try and monitor the chat QA box and try to uh, answer as many questions as I can. Uh, there were a few questions that were submitted prior to the uh, this webinar, so I'll try and um, cover those as well. Um, I also want to make just one quick side note. I noticed that there were a lot of athletic trainers that had registered for this webinar um, and asked if this webinar provides a CEU credit. Um, this webinar does not. However, uh, if you talk to your district um, uh, uh, officials, um, one of the things that we can do is set up a session uh, with one of the other webinars that we do have uh, that has been approved by the NATA for a CEU. So if that is of interest, uh, make sure to contact me following this webinar and um, we can talk about that. So let's go ahead and get started. Real quick, I just want to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Andrew Golden, and I'm the Director of Business Operations for Athlete Intelligence, and we are a head impact monitoring and performance tracking solution. Um, I've been involved with sports technology and specifically head health safety since early 2016. Um, as part of athlete intelligence, I've been responsible for really driving the company's go-to-market strategy and team analytics platform. So really being on the front lines of working with coaches, working with athletic trainers, key stakeholders about the evolution of, of head impact monitoring and um, you know how it's gonna be a viable solution for improving safety and performance. Um, and probably one of the more exciting things that I've been able to be a part of uh, as um, an employee of this company is um, leading support on some of the major research and in, uh, initiatives that we've been a part of. Um, we were selected as sensor of choice by the CDC to do the world's largest youth football study, um, um, along with a lot of other research that uses the type of data that we're going to go over in this webinar um, and, um, you know, talk a little bit about the value of it and um, its correlation to improving safety and performance. Um, rather than just jumping into our main topics here, um, I do want to talk about um, a, a few things that are going to help lay the foundation um, and, you know, discuss kind of head health safety full circle. So uh, we'll get into, you know, why are we having this conversation in the first place? Um, what head health safety innovations have we seen over the years? What kind of improvements have we been seeing? Um, 
then of course we'll talk about what is head impact monitoring, who benefits from it, why it's important, and then again, hopefully we'll have some time to do uh, some quick Q&A. So why are we talking about head impact monitoring? Well, for one, head injuries are a problem. Um, there's been a lot of research both um, currently and over the last number of years that um, continue to highlight the problems around head injuries, the problems around concussions. Um, while there's been so many improvements and innovations, uh, for some reason, we're, we're still seeing um, staggering statistics. So we're going to talk about the problem. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about injuries caused by head contact. So what we see in some of these patterns, um, correlations, causations, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what we are finding from the research that has been conducted uh, and has been published um, and how a lack of resources are contributing to some of these increases in head injuries and concussions. So the problem around head injuries. Well, it's no surprise that head injuries continue to drive concern and widespread controversy in contact and collision sports. Uh, we always hear about numbers of, of concussions in you know, football, women's soccer, wrestling. Um, and, and unfortunately, in some cases, those numbers are either staying the same uh, or going up. And um, while the number of concussions uh, it, you know, continues to be a, an alarming number. I always find three other statistics that really stand out to me and, and are somewhat alarming. And, and the first one is 80% um, of head related injuries and concussions often go unidentified, unrecognized and undiagnosed. The second 69% of athletes have admitted to hiding symptoms from coaches or athletic trainers to continue play. Um, this has been very big um, at all levels of play. Um, some might not know what the symptoms are of a concussion um, and therefore not know what to report. Um, and then you have the, the other side of athletes that are you know, purposefully bombing baseline tests uh, or cognitive tests um, or ones that are hiding symptoms to continue play in the hopes of not losing a roster spot. And then the third of uh, staggering stats is 33% of sports related injuries often occur in practice. And I always found this one to be extremely alarming because I always looked at practices as more controlled environments, uh, very tailored to specific drills that are going to have a high emphasis on, on safety. Um, so, you know, to see 33% of injuries occurring in practice, um, you know, that, that was obviously uh, very alarming to, to see. Injuries that are often caused by uh, head contact. Um, one of the main things that we're seeing is the frequency of unnecessary and continued head contact experienced both in games through practices are contributing to not just concussions, but also head injuries, uh, other head injuries, um, neck injuries, and studies are showing that um, exposing the crown of head through contact or athletes experiencing high head contact workloads are often driving these injuries. And, uh, you know, we've seen this unfortunately in a lot of NFL games where athletes are targeting with their head down um, and, and really putting their, their neck at risk. We've seen some, um, you know, unfortunately not be able to walk off the field and others that have been more fortunate, but but have been able to adapt their techniques from, from what they've been able to learn. So, um, you know, it's bigger than just concussions when we're talking about head contact. Um, and that's why this is such an, an important discussion and, and topic. So when we look at a lot of the research that has been conducted, um, there's been millions upon millions of dollars spent over the, the last handful of years really trying to understand, uh, you know, these causations, correlations, patterns within research. And 
what what we're noticing and 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 what what we take out of this are um, two areas: things that we can control and and, and things that we can't control. Um, it's difficult to control how athletes respond unique to head injuries or concussions, you know, whether it's uh, a history of concussions, whether it's male versus female, whether it's neck strength, um, a lot of those uncontrolled variables are, are difficult to manage. But when we start to look at patterns, there are three areas that um, we can't control. And one of them is exposing the crown of head through improper technique and or tackling. Um, this we see in football and soccer. Uh, we see this a lot within youth hockey and um, athletes skating with their heads down. They don't have their ice legs. They're, they're looking where they're going. Um, and because of this, we've seen a widespread and policy change. So no targeting, no leading with your head. Um, so we know that exposing the crown of the head drives these injuries. Um, and it is a main point we need to continue to think about as we will go through this presentation, um, but it's also something that's controllable. The second thing is overexposing athletes to high quantity of head impacts through games and practice drills. Um, two studies that uh, are a little bit more recent around this is one Indiana University that uh, athlete intelligence has helped out with looking at exposure rates, looking at how you can quantify head impact exposure, monitor, manage head in impact exposure throughout practice weeks. And um, by limiting that and, and focusing on eliminating head contact and lower contact drills, um, seeing the effects of um, safer performing athletes and, and less injuries. Uh, if anyone's familiar with the NC2A care consortium, that is a, another large group of universities that have come together to um, look at and research various topics. One research that was uh, just recently published was around uh, a 77% increase in concussions over the last five years for coll collegiate athletes. And a main driver of that was a significant increase in head impact exposure, right? So we know too many impacts is bad. And then the last one is that we know experiencing high G-force or problematic head impacts and not intervening within a timely manner drives head injuries and, and drives concussions. And these are things that are either missed. Um, they can be missed because it's not the initial tackle. It's happening away from the ball. Um, it's, you know, getting tackled and, and, and hitting your head on the ground or getting checked into the wall and, and, and hitting your head on the ground. Um, and in some cases, it might not even be a clear impact. It could just be such a hard body hit that creates um, a high level of rotational acceleration or whiplash, um, which, you know, still creates a head injury and, and concussion. So, um, Crown of head impacts, we know is important and we've learned that through research. Um, too many impacts is bad. We need to monitor, we need to manage and um, we need to intervene in a timely manner when, when we see or um, are, are aware of some of these large impacts. Um, and, and, and a lot of this is, is come from the research um, and, and has been backed by research and science. Another big thing is just lack of resources and how that contributes to head injuries. Um, one of the main things that we see both as an innovation, um, but also as a gap is how coaches have adapted new techniques to remove the head from unnecessary contact. So um, in football, this has been really big. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people on this call have heard the terms heads up style tackling, rugby style tackling, shoulder led tackling. So the idea around removing head from contact in all of these sports is um, the first step. It's a big step forward. But what we find is that coaches also struggle to gain the validation that what is being taught during practice is actually being performed on the field. So um, which of my athletes are following this technique and which of them are taking impacts and which ones aren't. 
because we know the ones that are might not be following the technique that we're teaching. The second thing that we find is athletic trainers are often under-resourced. Um, I don't know many youth programs that have full-time athletic trainers during games, during practice, um, at the high school level. Uh, I think we find high schools are lucky to have one full-time athletic trainer. Uh, they're under-resourced. They're required to be in, you know, responsible for so many athletes, so many different sports sometimes all occurring at the same time. Um, and so they need additional tools to provide extra eyes and ears on the field, right? If, if programs don't have the ability to hire full-time athletic trainers, then how do we help the athletic trainers that we have become more resourceful? And what we see is that teams and organizations do strive to improve athlete head safety. I, I've talked to so many different youth programs, high school programs, collegiate programs, even professional programs, and everyone wants to create a safer environment, but just oftentimes they lack the tools to adequately monitor exposure rates, poor technique that places athletes uh, at a greater risk of injury. One thing I mentioned I wanted to talk about was just uh, head health safety innovations and improvements over the years. Um, there has been a lot of improvements that we've seen uh, over the last five, 10 years uh, when it comes to creating safer environments for student athletes. Um, one big bucket is the equipment. We're seeing innovations from helmet manufacturers, padding manufacturers, uh, accessory manufacturers, all the way down to the shields, the face masks. Um, so there's a lot of new materials that are being designed to help mitigate forces or transfer forces away from the head. Uh, we're seeing improved designs, improved materials, um, if anyone's familiar with Buddy Tevens over at Dartmouth, we're seeing new accessories to promote safer play. So he has his tackling dummies, the motorized tackling dummies. So, you know, trying to create that athlete on athlete tackling or training experience, but um, rather than two athletes going at it, putting them against uh, a, a movable dummy. So looking at new equipment, looking at new accessories to promote head health safety, one piece of research that's also come out recently is about um, women's lacrosse and an increase in concussions over the last five years and evaluating if um, women's lacrosse helmets should be required. We've started to see more and more companies develop and manufacture women's lacrosse helmets. So um, equipment, I would say, has been a big part of the evolution and improvements around head health safety. Coaching, we talked a little bit about this in the previous slide. Uh, there's been extensive training and certifications that are required before coaches can even take the field or take the team. Um, there's been these new techniques to promote safer tackling. So you know, I mentioned rugby style tackling, shoulder led tackling, uh, you know, uh, high emphasis of removing the head from contact. I mean, it's easy math. If we have less head contact, uh, we're significantly reducing the risk of head related injuries. And then also just strategic practice plans and preseason preparation. So practice plans as far as, um, you know, how we prepare athletes to tackle, um, how uh, we are able to train them properly. Um, so there's a lot that goes into the coaching aspect of, um, you know, just creating safer athletes. And then um, from a protocol perspective, we are seeing either districts or states starting to require athletic trainers. I think this is a, a huge push that, you know, every sports uh, practice and game should have a medical professional on the sidelines. Um, there's been a uh, big overhaul in how we look at return to play requirements. Um, you know, a lot of school districts are implementing and requiring cognitive testing, different rule changes, 
Um, at the state level, we're seeing state mandated injury tracking. So um, creating centralized databases that help us understand, you know, what are the leading injuries? What sports are they playing? What were they doing when they got injured? Because with that data, we can start to look again at these patterns, these trends and, and, and start to look at, okay, is there a protocol or policy that we need to adjust? Um, and then protocols, again, around uh, eliminating or limiting contact. So um, whether that is um, not heading a soccer ball until a certain age, uh, whether that's not being allowed to uh, check players in hockey until a certain age, um, or even within football at the high school and collegiate level of only allowing a certain number of uh, um, contact practices. So now we get into our, our main topic. What is head impact monitoring? And as we get into what head impact monitoring is, we'll also talk about what head impact monitoring isn't, uh, different types of head impact monitoring devices and data outputs from head impact monitoring devices. So what is head impact monitoring? Uh, head impact monitoring, plain and simple, is the ability to measure, monitor, and manage the head contact athletes sustain during competitive play or practice. Uh, typically, this is gathered through wearable sensor technology. Um, at the end of the day, it, it's really data. Uh, these devices that uh, I'll, I'll share with you or that you've maybe seen in the past, it, they're really data collection devices. Um, it's a quantitative measurements of head impact exposure. And, um, you know, most of the time, it's not necessarily about the sensor itself, but it's about the system that should be designed to bring awareness to the key performance indicators of the head impact sustained by athletes. So like we talked about quantity of athletes, or I'm sorry, quantity of impacts, quantity, uh, uh, location of impacts and severity of impacts. Um, and, um, you, you know, it's an added safety and performance resource for team staff or uh, team stakeholders. This uh, is typically something that should help bring new awareness, new information, uh, be an added resource to the things that we can't see from being on the sidelines or from watching film. Just as important, what head impact monitoring isn't. Um, I, I always think this is an important topic because when I ask people uh, what they do for head impact monitoring, I often get two different responses. One, what is head impact monitoring? And the second is, well, we do baseline testing. Um, and that tells me that, again, still not a lot of people know what, what head impact monitoring is, um, but, but also tells me that there's a lot of misconceptions around what it is and how it can be used. So one of the first things that I always try to make very clear that head impact monitoring is not a system that's going to prevent, identify, or diagnose concussions. That's why we have athletic trainers. That's why we have trained medical professionals to look for the symptoms, to um, look for those cognitive ch uh, changes. Um, and, and at this point, there is no technology that is going to replace that decision making. Um, so a system that uh, will replace decision making from a trained professional, uh, head impact monitoring is not going to do that. It's not going to, um, you know, tell you something that um, you should be doing. It, 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 it should be empowering you with new information that you can use to make more informed decisions. So um, head impact monitoring is not a sideline personnel replacement. Um, I do not recommend that, you know, teams evaluate, hey, do we, you know, get an athletic trainer or do we get a head impact monitoring system? These two things should not be compared against each other and should not be a decision. Um, it is not a, a, a sideline personnel replacement. And it's not a replacement for, for cognitive testing. Um, head impact monitoring is not going to tell you necessarily if an athlete uh, has any um, changes in uh, their, their cognitive responses. Um, so, you know, if you're using a baseline test process, um, keep doing that. Uh, this is only going to help you be more resourceful within that, that tool that you're using. 
So going into some of the different types of head impact monitoring devices, um, most commonly, uh, and, and if you followed any of the research, a lot of it is being conducted with mouth guards. Uh, mouth guards, um, you know, have and provide the highest level of accuracy. Um, in many cases, they can be sport agnostic um, and, you know, have really helped the research community get the highest level of accuracy um, from the head kinematics, what's happening on the field. Um, but, but some of the cons that we see is that uh, sometimes there's a, a, a difficult time with athlete adoption. Uh, whether athletes don't wear a mouth guard in, in that particular sport or opt out of wearing a mouth guard in that particular sport. Um, mouth guards over the years and, and even today have come, become a lot more flashy. So you see mouth guards with, um, you know, the, the binky style or some cool graphics on it. So, um, you know, trying to change behavior in the type of mouth guard an athlete wears can sometimes be difficult, um, but also comfort and, and cost can can be um, challenges in, in some cases because um, they are a little bit different um, when compared to standard mouth guards that may be in the market today. Uh, other types of devices um, are helmet sensors, whether they're helmet affixed and can be put inside of a helmet, um, whether it's part of the padding within a helmet. Um, helmet sensors from a team perspective have been um, widely used and have a much higher athlete adoption rate just because um, it doesn't require them to change habits, change you know what they're wearing or, or how they feel. And in many cases, the athlete doesn't even know that there is a, a sensor inside their helmet. Um, they also become a lot more affordable and uh, multi-purpose and, and multi-use. So uh, with some of the head impact monitoring helmet sensors out there, uh, teams are able to use it within a football team and, and then you know later move it to a lacrosse team. Uh, but then again, the challenge with these helmet sensors is, um, you know, in order to get head impact data, um, they've got to be on a helmet or affixed to a headband. Um, so, uh, you know, if you're dealing with a sport that athletes don't traditionally wear a helmet or headband, uh, getting them to wear a helmet or a headband can be difficult if uh, a helmet affixed sensor is the route that you are hoping to go. And then there's also been some obsolete sensors. So things like skin patches. Um, at one point I heard about an ear, ear canal sensor um, that was being developed uh, where you would almost wear it like a, a Bluetooth or, or, or ear, ear piece um, that would be able to track head impacts um, and then various light up sensors. So things that turn red, green or yellow depending on the severity of impact. So, you know, the head impact monitoring device landscape has, has really evolved over the years. We've seen a lot of companies um, try to enter into the space um, and, you know, really only see a small handful being successful and being able to, to add value um, in this market. Types of data outputs that you should expect from head impact monitoring devices. Um, traditionally, uh, they're going to collect a lot of data. Um, you know, things like peak linear acceleration, peak rotational acceleration, all of this data um, is being collected on the device. And it's important to collect a lot of this data because when you have this data, it, that's what's then turned into where we have actionable insights, right? So when we have peak linear acceleration or peak rotational acceleration or um, rotational velocity, um, that raw data is what allows us to turn it into things like quantity of impacts, like the location of the impact, like the severity of the impact, and then be able to run more calculations in, around uh, exposure and workload rates uh, and being able to compare averages and outliers within a, a particular team. So who benefits from head impact monitoring? Well, well right now there's really two main markets. Um, there's the research market. Um, head impact monitoring is really the only way to gather on field and live data head kinematics. Um, it provides researchers with raw data modeling to better understand impact waveforms, impact durations. Um, and this type of data is what has helped them through a lot of these 
um, research papers of understanding the various patterns that we're seeing within concussions and head injuries. Um, but for the research, it's really about the, the sensor being a data collection device or a data collection tool. Uh, the other uh, main benefit is from the team use. So as a team use, uh, it being a safety tool, um, it being a performance tool, it being a coaching tool, a resource, uh, added resource and uh, athletic training tool. So there's really two main uses of where the market is benefiting from head impact monitoring. But where, you know, I really want to focus on is that team aspect. Um, the, the data and the research is great because that's what's going to help us understand the patterns, the trends, and what's actually happening. The team aspect is how we now use that information to intervene with our athletes, uh, help them become better performing athletes and therefore safer performing athletes. So with research, we know there's the causation and correlations, brain modeling patterns, um, more of the technical side. Um, leagues and organizations, um, we've seen a lot institute uh, safety initiatives. Uh, use it for recruitment. Um, I, I mentioned early in this presentation that there's been a number of leagues or programs that have had to consolidate because of a decline in participation rates and parents fearful around concussions and head injuries. On the flip side, we've seen leagues and organizations implement head impact monitoring solutions and increase participation rates. Right. So being able to show them, look, all of our coaches are certified. We're using the, you know, the top rated helmets and pads. Um, and, you know, we're using head impact monitoring to know, you know, who's taking the most amount of impacts and how that's correlated to technique adjustments. Uh, another big benefit from head impact monitoring is athletic directors. Uh, many athletic directors or district athletic directors use this as a way to compare against different sports, different schools within their district. Do we have one high school program that is taking far more head impacts compared to other high school programs within their district? Why is that? Is it because of the drills? Is it because of the amount of contact practices that they're running? Um, so, you know, it really helps with creating and conceptualizing what's happening uh, within their district. We talked about the big benefit from coaches. Uh, coaches want their athletes to perform better. Uh, they want them to perform safer. So uh, they get the benefit of this being a technique tool, a training tool, and that tackling validation tool. Uh, more frequently for me and in, in, in my business with high school sports, we hear a lot about how the data has helped uncover negative patterns. So particular athletes or positions that um, are taking more impacts that have been correlated to technique improvements and the coaches use that work closer with the athletes and often we'll see a significant increase um, in athlete performance and significant decrease in head impact exposure workloads, thus giving them that validation that, hey, these guys are getting what I'm teaching them. <clears throat> Another big benefit is our athletic trainers, right? So we talked about the additional resource, additional eyes and ears on the field, being able to gain insights, maybe when we're not even there, uh, we have a handful of athletic trainers that um, have to make the decision of, do I stay at my home uh, football game or go to my away lacrosse game? And, you know, head impact monitoring has allowed athletic trainers to you know, make the tough decision of which game they choose, um, but still be able to gain head impact insights for uh, the events that they can't be at. So uh, bringing contacts, bringing them, you know, data around, hey, you know, did anyone take any big impacts? Uh, was there anything of concern that I need to act on? 
And then even athletes are uh, benefiting from this. So, um, you know, athletes want to perform better. They want to perform safer. They want to stay on the field. They don't want to get injured. And so um, we find that athletes really like and, 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 and enjoy the conversations that they're able to have with their coaches or with their athletic trainers on new insights and ways that they can improve their performance and safety. And then the last uh, group is the parents. Uh, it's safety, safety, safety. Um, we see this time and time again um, through youth programs, high school programs, getting the parents involved. Um, you know, head health safety is a, a very important topic and someone and something that everyone wants to see improved. Um, one of the things that I've also seen. Uh, uh, to be very interesting with some of our college programs is when they go and do those recruiting trips and go to the parents, they talk about, hey, you know, we, we also know that a very small percentage of college level athletes go on to play professional sports. And, um, you know, for that reason, we use a head impact monitoring system um, that is going to help us, um, you know, keep your, your son or daughter safe. Um, in preparation for, for life after sports. And so there's so many different parties that can benefit from head impact monitoring, the data that's involved, the resources that it brings. Um, and it's just been, you know, so great to see um, how data is continuing to emerge uh, these, these different um, buckets and um, how insightful uh, and resourceful it's, it's, it's being for them when they're, when they're making different decisions. So why is head impact monitoring important? Um, well, for one, if we know how many hits our children take, we'll be able to reduce the number. If we reduce the number of hits, we'll reduce concussions. If we, if we reduce concussions, we'll protect our athletes. That is a fact. Um, we've you know, talked about that in the research. We've uh, talked about how um, you know, we can significantly reduce head related injuries if we reduce uh, head contact. Um, that was a huge outcome out, out of the, the study that was um, recently published. And just a big thing that correlates back to head impact monitoring systems, right? Because they are giving you the ability to monitor, manage, um, and measure what these head impact workloads look like. You can't manage what you don't measure. So we have to start with data. Um, and when we have that data, we can control it. The second thing is if we eliminate impacts to the crown of the head, we significantly reduce the risk of head, neck, and spinal related injuries. Again, this is a fact. We've seen this through research. Um, we've seen um, the, 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 the catastrophic events that happen from leading with the top of your head or tackling with the top of your head, hence why we've seen policy changes. Um, head impact monitoring systems are going to show you patterns of athletes um, that maybe haven't been injured yet from, from crown of head contact, but are taking more frequently impacts to the top of their head um, which is a negative trend, which is a negative pattern, um, which is something that if we can catch it early on, change behavior, um, we can, you know, we, we can prevent uh, these uh, catastrophic injuries from occurring. And then third, if we intervene within a timely manner and monitor how each athlete reacts to bigger impacts, we save lives. That's a, another fact. We know it's big impacts. Um, we know um, missed impacts are a problem. Um, we've all heard about second impact syndrome. And so um, driving fast decision making is important. Uh, making sure we don't miss problematic impacts is important. Uh, and head impact monitoring is another way that we're going to be able to make sure that nothing gets missed, nothing goes unseen, um, and we can intervene within a timely manner. And then lastly, um, if we use data trends to identify and proper technique, we can improve performance, um, we can improve safety, uh, and um, you know we can do this before a potential injury occurs. And so it's the same thing around you know how we use data. Uh, we use data to look at trends, to look at patterns, to look at outliers. Um, if we can identify a subset of athletes that are putting themselves at a greater risk of injuries because of these negative trends, we can act quick, we can act fast, we can create coachable moments, we can change technique, um, and, and, and we can, you know, 
hopefully prevent them from uh, experiencing any sort of injuries. And again, this, this is another fact. <clears throat> so in summary, um, head related injuries remain a problem and concern for many contact and collision sports. Um, you know, I think whenever a new sports season starts or ends, the conversations are always around um, concussions and head injuries. And, um, you know, we've done a lot, but, but clearly there's gaps and more needs to be done. Um, head impact monitoring is a missing resource, adding a high level of value to team stake holders. Um, for people who truly want to create uh, safer environments, um, you know, who, who really want to see a reduction of head related injuries. Um, it's going to come down to how we monitor, manage, uh, and measure, uh, head impacts and head impact workloads. Um, three teams who embrace safety innovations often see higher participation rates and lower number of injuries. Uh, um, you know, this is a, a, a big thing now as teams are gearing up post COVID and, and, you know, really trying to drive and get more people out to play. Um, safety is going to be a big part of that. Um, so it's, it's definitely something that organizations are going to be challenged to consider and evaluate uh, as they um, return to sports. And, you know, I just want to say thank you for everyone uh, and joining this. I, I Honestly, I really hope that you found it valuable. Um, you found it insightful. Uh, most importantly, I hope that you're able to walk away with more knowledge around what head impact monitoring is and why it's important um, than you did prior to, to coming into uh, this session. So I know we do have a, um, I do know that we have a few minutes left. Uh, so I wanna go over a couple of questions. Um, if you don't have any questions um, or you wanna submit a question, the Q and A and the chat is still open. I've also got my email address uh, here. Feel free to email me um, if you have any questions or wanna talk a little bit more in depth about some of these topics that we discussed today. Um, I also have our social media platforms. Please follow us. We've got some awesome content that we try to stay uh, up to date with as far as industry news, uh, tech innovations, and just some things that we're doing here at, at Athlete Intelligence. So if you don't stay for the Q&A session, uh, I understand and, and appreciate you joining. Um, I do want to get into some of these pre-submitted questions that were emailed. Um, so the first question I got is, am I required to pull an athlete uh, if, I, if I get an alert for a big impact. And um, this, this is a, a fairly common question I get because you know we talked about with head impact monitoring systems, oftentimes there are um, features or functions where you can get alerts to your phone or to your watch or to your pager that, that notifies you of a big impact. One of the things to understand is the goal of those alerts aren't necessarily to replace your decision-making. Because you get an alert, you are not required to pull that player. The purpose of those alerts are to, to inform you. Um, let's say you're taping an ankle and you don't see something um, and you get an alert, right? That is going to um, cause you to get up, look at the athlete who took the impact, look for them on the field. Okay, are they getting up slow or are they getting up fast? So think of it as a tool to empower decision making, not replace it. Um, how affordable are these systems? So there are uh, a, 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 an array of, of different systems that you can find. Um, you know, all the companies out there uh, are, are awesome companies doing some really great things with head impact monitoring, both on the research side and team side. Um, from what I've seen, um, and, and again, if you find a, a solution or system that you like, obviously they'll, they'll give you pricing. But from what I see, I, I, I typically find pricing to be around um, $99 to, to, to $299 per athlete. Um, and then some of the more advanced and professional level sensors can be as much as a, a thousand to, to $1,500. So um, 
there's definitely affordable solutions out there. Um, there's lots uh, of different options to evaluate, again, depending on if you want a mouth guard or, or helmet to fix. So, uh, you know, it never hurts to go and, and contact these companies and, um, you know, see what uh, packages and pricing would be. Um, how do teams typically pay for their systems? Um, that, that's a really good question. Um, I would say from my personal experience, we find that um, the conversation around head health safety um, is a very important topic. So at the high school level, it typically involves, you know, superintendents, district athletic directors, um, and there's a lot of support that can come from um, athletic budgets. Uh, in some cases, uh, it drives a lot of awareness and interest from booster clubs. So I wouldn't be surprised if you're a high school and your booster club catches wind of this. Uh, it, it becomes a very easy story for them to go out and fundraise for. Um, some of the things that I've seen personally um, at, at Athlete Intelligence, we have an insurance subsidy program where we've partnered with some insurance companies and they help pay for the system. Um, other ways have been through um, uh, technology budgets, uh, STEM budgets. So again, if you're in a high school athletic trainer, maybe you have a sports medicine class, uh, maybe you're able to tie that into your coursework and, and it opens you up to some of the educational budgets. And so um, what I find is that those who take the next step and, and choose to embrace data analytics, choose to embrace head impact monitoring and, and embrace the story of what head impact monitoring, you know, means to athlete safety. Um, funding it isn't typically the, the hardest thing to do. And um, uh, another pre-submitted question here is, can we, um, can we only use sensors on a small amount of athletes like two to three? Um, I guess there's no real wrong way um, to use these devices. Um, asking me specifically, uh, you know, you have to think of every athlete as a data point. The more data points you have, uh, the more of a baseline you can create, the more of team averages or positional averages you can create and therefore the more of the outliers you can find so people performing outside of the averages so um, typically you know more is always going to be better um, however you know when you're focusing on um, high contact positions uh, we typically see minimums around you know if you Think about your offensive line, your defensive line, your linebackers, your running backs. Um, it's typically between that uh, 20 to 25 athletes. Um, uh, let's see. Oh, I, I so um, it doesn't look like I have any questions uh, in the QA. Just a comment that says, um, the slides were a little bit too small. Um, I hope that wasn't for um, everyone, but um, in case you did have a problem um, watching this presentation, seeing what we have on the slides, uh, what I can do is this, this has been recorded. Um, I can send everyone a recording of this. Um, and if you are interested in the slide deck, uh, shoot me an email, agolden at athleteintelligence.com. And um, I can send you a copy of this, but um, you know, lastly, it's it's been uh, so appreciative for everyone to take time out of their days to sit through this hour session to learn about head impact monitoring, uh, to learn about how um, we're really trying to you know evolve what head health safety looks like, uh, taking a data driven approach. So. Really hope everyone uh, was able to learn about head impact monitoring, learn why it's important. We've got a lot of other webinars that um, we're going to be doing throughout the next couple of months. Uh, we're going to be going into some live demonstrations you'll see from our impact lab here. Um, we're going to have webinars on how to fundraise systems. Uh, we're going to do webinars with some uh, key personnel, so current coaches, current athletic trainers that we work with. Um, so we just want to keep this uh, relevant, uh, you know, have some topics that are of interest. 
um, and you know, make sure that people are walking away with these with some valuable information. So thank you again, everyone for joining me on this webinar. Uh, and I hope we are able to stay connected uh, following this webinar. Um, awesome. Thank you for the, the great comments in there. And uh, I will uh, hopefully talk to everyone in the, the near future here. Thank you.